Sorry about that. Um, I want to thank Maria first for the uh, nice introduction for moderating this session. And thank you for having me. And thanks, everybody, for, for joining. Um, so my name is Chi. And it's really my pleasure to share uh, this paper that we published early this year uh, with you guys. Um, so like Maria said, it's about leveraging multiple lines of evidence and of innovation to, to, ass, to assess the warming impact on uh, marine fishes. Okay, so I think everybody here can appreciate, uh, you know, warming can have this wide, uh, far-reaching effect on processes at multiple levels from the cellular up, up, you know, to the ecosystem levels. So uh, if we can somehow use, you know, multiple sources of data to get this question, and that would be better. So the idea behind this paper is, is uh, really to combine um, three important aspects where warming can have a really profound effect and use the, the, uh, the size-based full width uh, model, MISER, as the modeling backbone. And two other components are the spatial distribution of species. So I use species distribution modeling, SDMs. And also I look at how the species life history can change with warming. So this figure uh, just gives you the overall idea of how I integrate all this data into under the same sort of umbrella under MISER. So with SDMs, you know, we use the occurrence and occurrence data and the associated temperature. And also there's a way to use the thermal tolerance physiological data from species. And with that, we can output, we can predict in this area, you know, if we sort of divide the area into, into a lot of cells. Uh, where in which cells a species might be present under future climates. And with that, uh, we can use that output and to estimate um, uh, what would be the changes in the uh, you know, interaction matrices that we're going to use later on in MISER, which you know, measures the connectivity of different species, you know, which, which species we encounter, which the other species in, at what you know, frequency, and then um, so that determines part of the full web dynamics in this, in this model. And also I use the, the change in available habitats to estimate changes in future catches. Because to use MISER, you have to have a, you know, a catch data to get the first pass ballpark estimation on biomass. So, but you know, we don't know how it's gonna change in the future. So uh, do, by doing this, uh, we can have some sort of estimate. And then, uh, in the uh, for the life history of species, we use published level data uh, because you know if you look at species, there are you go on fish base and you find out that they occur at different you know multiple different places on the planet, and each place has its own temperature. And people all have also measured the, the key life history traits in each populations. So with that, we can use uh, you know stat, uh, statistical models to uh, sort of extrapolate what those key life history traits might change under future climates. So that's going to be important because that result can be input into the MISER model. So, you know, if you followed all the lines and arrows, you can see how, you know, the, uh, the two components can inform us uh, how to construct a MISER model under future climates. So the results we want to get at from MISER is these three emerging properties, which is the population structure, the size spectra, of each species and also the community as a whole and the biomass and uh, the community resilience. Okay, so uh, because this is a method paper, uh, so we are focusing on just one economical region, which is the continental shelf of Eastern US. And we picked this region because um, it's, there's a long, a long history of uh, trawling. So that gives us a lot of occurrence data, like the present absence data, and also because the, these areas are really densely sampled throughout the years. So that's, that make it easier when, when we have to use, uh, when we have to construct the SDMs, because we don't have to go, we don't have to sort of use some really complicated method to estimate um, absence from the present only data. So that's, that's convenient. And there, there are a lot of species uh, in this long-term data set. And uh, at, in, at this point, uh, because you know the SDM is kind of data intensive, so we sort of weed it down to 37, and that number is going to decrease even further later on. Um, but so this is the, the area we're focusing on, and the SDM that we use is this recent method developed by Toludo et al. and used by another paper in, two, in 2020 
And so this is a Bayesian method, which is, you know, if we have the present absolute data from, you know, from before until the present, and we can use that to estimate, uh, to come with a, a, a prediction that tells you, okay, if I give this, this uh, model a new set of temperature data, and it's gonna, I can use this model to, to uh, infer, okay, at which temperatures this species might be present and at what others they might be absent. And the good thing about this method is that if you have any sort of, you know, uh, idea about the relationship between fitness and temperature, you can actually use that. And that's going to better inform the construction of this SDM. And for marine fish, so normally you have to have this data by actually measure in a lab. You have to, you know, get the individuals and then subject them to various temperatures in the lab and measure there some sort of fitness proxy. For marine fishes, this is not possible in a lot of, in a lot of species. But uh, in the paper, we have this really um, uh, simple way to come up with this particular curve. And I'm not going to go over the details here, but uh, if you're interested, you can just read the paper. And um, it's very effective and very, very simple. OK, so this is the SDM. So with that, we can uh, you know, say, here it shows you the 19 species that we're actually using in the, in the paper. So you can compare the, you know, if you look at closely, uh, the, the whole area is divided into, into uh, 600 something cells that each, you know, represented by each, by, by all these little dots. So the, the figure on the, on the left is the current distribution, current means 2013. And then on the right is the predicted distribution of each species at the end of the century under RCP 4.5. And we can do the same thing for RCP 8.5. So you can tell um, that can inform us whether, you know, how the species interactions might change and also how, because of habitat shrinkage or expansion in some, in some cases, uh, how the future catches might be different from, from uh, you know, what we have now. Okay, so moving on to the life history part. So this is really inspired by two papers published in 2020. What a coincidence. One of them is by Asta, uh, I think it's she's in Julius group. And the other is by this colleague of mine, Dr. Wang um, in Taiwan. So they both use, uh, like I mentioned earlier, they use this, you know, the, the present sort of uh, uh, data between temperature and uh, life history traits in various populations in different places. And they construct this, this uh, you know, this sort of regression model so on the x-axis, you have this temperature anomaly. So zero is the all the mean temperature from all the populations. So I'm here using the Atlantic Herring example. So if you if you um, scale all the temperatures, uh, you know from the mean, then you have this regression line that tells you, okay, well, if the the the, the species experiences something like a two degree shift to the right from this mean temperature, uh, what you know, how will this maximum weight in this case might change? So that gives us some idea about under future climate when it's warmer, uh, you know, how we might expect, you know, the, the key life history traits to be different from uh, what they are now, the, the mean value they are now. So we do this for every, all the 19 species that we have. And um, so this is how we incorporate life history data information uh, and, and, and use that to sort of get at what may happen in the future. So this is like the overall, so you know, each dot is a population. So I'm not coloring all the, you know, all the, all the species, I, I'm not separating them by color, but if you see the, the different color lines, they are species from different habitats. Uh, this is just this, let us just allows us to see whether there's any pattern, uh, you know, in, in terms of habitat. So whether demersal species are say their uh, maximum weight would change more with warming or not. I mean, we, we don't see any, any clear pattern uh, in, this, in this community, but that is what we are trying to, trying to show uh, in, in this figure. Okay, so going back to the beginning, so I've, I've really talked about what we did for the SDM and how we you know, analyze life history data, and then we're gonna put them all into the MISER model. So I think I'm not, I don't have to spend much time on this slide because I think you all probably all know more, much more about MISER than I do, to be honest. Um, but MISER is this really, really powerful framework that allows me or allow my, you know, us to, to, to really integrate all these different informations under the same sort of framework. Okay, so for each species, you, you get something like this. Um, so the curves is the, site, is the species spectra. 
So I think, again, everybody should be a pretty uh, familiar with this. And we also plot two, plotted two uh, addition, additional information on this graph. One is little biomass, and which are the horizontal lines, and the mean body, uh, body size, which, is the, which are the vertical lines. And different climate scenarios are, are colored differently. Okay, so this is the, the result for all the species. It's quite a busy plot. And, but uh, I think I wanna focus you on the three general trends that we found, which is under warming uh, for the most species, total biomass decreased, but the maximum weight also decreased, but the mean body weight increased. So we, we see these shifts in, in size spectra, uh, well, in general, you know, from all the species that are considered, so if we take that result and we sort of map, you know, look at it in a different way. So these four figures, the A and C are the results when we compare the current situation to RCB 4.5 and B and D is when we compare the current situation to RCB 8.5. So we want to see how, you know, warming, how we might change uh, abundance or mean size for different species. And the red dotted line means there's no change. So, you know, if you compare now versus future, there's no difference. And again, like different species are colored uh, differently based on their habitat use and also based on their, you know, their climate zone, temperature versus subtropical. So again, we're trying to see if we see any sort of, you know, maybe one type of fish is more impacted uh, by warming as far as change in abundance and mean size are concerned than others. And we don't really see that. So what we're seeing is that the responses to warming were mostly species specific. But I want to I want to you know emphasize that because we only have 19 species. We have a lot of data, but because the number of species is still quite small, you know, we should take this result as a, in, with a grain of salt. This is really just to show you with more data one day what we can, what kind of question we can answer um, with this method. Okay, so uh, with the size spectrum from all the species, we can have a community size spectrum, and then we can sort of ask, we simulate perturbations and to, 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 to see how resilient this community is under warming. So there are numerous ways to do to simulate perturbations, and the way we pick only two. So we, we simulated this top-down perturbation by, you know, imposing this 50% 50, 50 mortality of all individuals larger than 10 grams, and another bottom-up perturbation, which is a 50% increase in background resources. And we do that, and then, and then we let the community go, you know, being perturbed, and then uh, go back to another city state. Um, and we measure the return time and use that as, a, as, an, as, as a measure of resilience. Okay, so here is the result. So basically, um, warming does influence community resilience. And so, um, you know, the numbers you can see, this is, you know, put out from a table in the paper. Uh, but basically, again, just to show you, uh, if you're interested in, in estimating community resilience, you can do that. Okay, so we talked about, I mean, the, you know, the, one of the, uh, the good things about this method is that it really uses multiple lines of data. So we want to make sure, you know, if one, data source is dominating, um, has a dominating effect on the final outcome, then the whole thing would be redundant. So for example, if uh, the change in life history is really, really driving the final outcome of, you know, of changes in biomass or abundance, then maybe it doesn't make that much sense to consider anything else. So we just wanna make sure that is, how much is, you know, how much is that the case or whether it's not the case, whether it, you know, it, it, it's the, it, it, that is the case at all. So, in this graph, I, I, uh, you know, on the x-axis, I have two life history variables: the change in maximum size and change in growth coefficient, and the third variable, which is the change in habitat availability. And on the y-axis is change in biomass, which is a key output variable from from the miser and from from this method. So, what we see here is that you know it, the the solid dots and uh, solid points and solid line is when we compare uh, uh, the present to the RCP 4.5 at the end of century. And the, the, uh, the empty points and the dotted line is when we compare 
the present to RCP 8.5. So if you see a high correlation in any of the graphs, that means that uh, one of the input variables is really driving the final outcome, which is the, you know, one of them is the, the biomass uh, uh, here. So we don't really see that. So that's uh, comforting because that means that not, you know, all these components provide unique insight into this whole process. So if you just look at changes in maximum size or life history in general, it's gonna be a poor predictor of biomass under warming. So you really have to take all these things into account. But there's one exception, which is uh, if you look at um, uh, the correlation between change in habitat availability and change in biomass in RCP 8.5, the R square is actually pretty high, which means that the, the, the change in super habitats is really has a lot to do uh, in, in determining the final outcome, the final prediction of biomass change. And that is because if you remember, we use the change in habitat suitability in, in available habitats as an estimate for future catches, which is what we use to get this first pass ballpark estimation of biomass, you know, uh, from miser. So this is a caution because if you use this method one day and you, you find yourself um, faced with, okay, well, under, under warming, my community really, the, you know, the distribution of speed really changes a lot. Then you might have to think about whether that is, that has a large effect on the outcome you're getting from this method. Okay, so, uh, that is one of the things to consider, which is the, I think the, the third point. And a couple other things too. So uh, depending on how, how you construct your SDM. So in, in, in this case, we only use temperature, but you can, you can all, of course use, you know, something about some information about the primary production. When you do that and you're gonna be, so the primary production data is gonna be uh, used in SDM, but also in MISER. So potentially there might be some overlap or even potential redundancy when you do that. And I don't really have a good suggestion about whether or not to include primary production uh, information when you construct your SDMs, but that's something to think about. Uh, the second thing is if you are, again, if you find yourself in a situation where you, um, a lot of the population level life history data is lacking for your species, and that is not the end of the world because uh, there are two ways to sort of, to get around this problem. One is uh, there's a paper published by Thorsen et al. in 2017, where he derived a bunch of equations. And I think all, you, if I remember correctly, all you need is maybe two or three life history variables and you can you can derive everything else from, from those three. So that's a convenient sort of uh, way to, to get this life history data where you don't have, you know, um, when fish space doesn't really, it's not really helpful. And the other, the other method is use thermizer uh, developed by, uh, by Phoebe uh, uh, with, with Jeff Coates. So that thermizer allows you to, to um, take into account of the temperature effects on the metabolic rate and also search volume. And, and even though there's not a direct link between the metabolic rate change and life history trait change, but, but there is a, you know, you can, if you have any sort of information about how the two might relate, uh, you can go from the changes in metabolic rate to changes in life history traits. So that's another potential solution to this problem. Um, so the, the final point I wanna make is that, you know, if your uh, species current data is not in the form of present absence, that's okay. For some uh, community, I think North Sea, for example, is there are actually abundance there available. That is even better. So the SDM, the Bayesian, uh, you know, regression that I use in this and in this SDM can easily accommodate that. Um, so um, I just want to point this out because you know that is actually might be a better sort of might have more sort of information um, in a data set than just simply present absence occurrences. Um, so uh, I think that's all I have to share. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. So just briefly talk about, am I going over time? How long have I been talking? Oh, okay, okay, great. Okay, all right. Um, so what I've been working on is is I, I am trying to apply this method 
to more communities, uh, you know, in the planet. So I can, because I'm, I'm not, so my background is not in fisheries or uh, I'm more of like an ecologist. So I wanted to really want to, 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 to sort of uh, look at what kind of species would be impacted more by warming. So, you know, something I mentioned before, whether it's, you know, certain fishes uh, living in certain habitat types or a certain taxonomic group, or, you know, fish living in temperate zones versus like subtropical versus tropical zones, something like that. So I'm currently working on this, but there's a, there, there's a lot of knowledge gaps for me because I'm, this is not my background. And I want to point out, especially uh, in the plankton department, um, that is something that I, I think, if you read the paper, I think that's something that this, this method can use a lot of refinement for, and that's something I'm not very savvy about. So um, again, I mean, if you have any sort of insight or feedback or thoughts or suggestions really, and, you know, for this method and for any sort of future directions, and, um, you know, I'll, I'll be grateful to hear, to hear from you. So I think that that's about, that's about it. And Again, thank you, and and I'm happy to talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. Great, uh, thank you very much, Chi.